2 Timothy chapter 2, please. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Go ahead if you if you would get a uh, get your place over in let's see Mark chapter five. Would you get there too, please? Put a finger there. We'll go there after we read Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy two two verses twenty five and twenty six. The Bible says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. And let's pray together. Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, thank you already for the wonderful time we've had together tonight, being able to sing some uh, of the Christmas carols together the fellowship among the saints, the time of prayer together for our missionaries, for other needs that we have here at our church. And Lord, it's, uh, it's just good to be in church on Wednesday night. And Lord, we're asking you now that you would open our eyes, that we could build wondrous things out of your word as we look into it this evening. Holy Spirit of God, be our teacher. Guide us into all truth as we look into your word. Minister to each and every heart of every individual that's here, Lord. Move up and down these aisles, in and out of the rows, and I pray, Lord, that you would minister to each of us tonight. Each of us would be yielded to the Spirit of God, that we might listen with the intent to obey the Bible we learned this evening. It's in your name we ask it. Amen. Well, we've been a while here in Second Timothy about making a difference and uh, being in the ministry of recovery, recovering those that oppose themselves, and uh, probably the perfect, one of the, one of the good illustrations of this is Mark chapter 5, and if you look there, uh, the Bible says, they came over under the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus far off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out, entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus, and to see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting and clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. That's an amazing story of transformation that takes place, and it's a great example of someone who gets recovered out of the snare of the devil. And in this case, many devils who possessed him uh, in uh, living, here's a guy living in the tombs, living in the graveyard. Now most people, when you decide you're looking for a house, you don't say, you know, I'd really like to find something that's right close to the graveyard. Most people aren't looking for something like that, let alone in the graveyard. And uh, this, this fellow was in the graveyard, and he was completely out of control. Nobody could tame him. He was not manageable. He was not controllable. He was not civilized. Uh, he ran around without any clothes on. He would yell and scream and 
cut himself and mark himself. And they tried to, to, to chain him. They tried to put fetters on him, not, not to hurt him, to try to keep him from hurting himself. And he just busted them off like they were nothing. And, and so, obviously, they were afraid of him. And they all steered clear of the fella who lived out in the cemetery. All right? Until Jesus comes. And, and then, uh, he, he adjures the, commands the unclean spirits to come out of him, and thus they go into the pigs, and the pigs go and run off the cliff and drown themselves in the sea. And, and of course, the devil comes, but to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that's what they were doing to this man's life. If they did that to the pigs, what do you think they were doing to him? And so, uh, he ends up uh, coming to Jesus and... By the end of the day, they come out to see what was done. You notice the transformation now? He's sitting, whereas he was running all the time before and screaming. He's clothed. And by the way, always, the closer you get to God, the more modest you'll dress. The more clothes you'll put on. And so here he is clothed and in his right mind. And, and the, the, the amazing part is, the last part of that verse, now they're afraid of him. Isn't that amazing? I understand being afraid about the first guy. <laughs> but you got nothing to be afraid of with this guy. But some of you will understand that. Some of you in the next few days when you get together for your Christmas time and maybe with extended family, extended relatives, some of them are afraid of you. Not because you're a lunatic, though that may be debatable with some. But, you know, you're, no, because you're, cause you love the Lord. And you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's scary to them. And so they, they, they don't understand what that's all about. But I think for the transformation, you see the transformation from this guy being naked, cutting himself, screaming, untamed, unmanageable, running around, out of, out of control, his control or anybody else's control to where now he's sitting, he's clothed, he's in his right mind, he's having a conversation with Jesus. You know what that is? That is biblical recovery. That is biblical transformation. Right there in his life. Jesus, you understand something? Jesus didn't just come to die on the cross, be raised again the third day for our salvation, but he was also did it so we could recover those who've been taken captive by Satan. When Jesus began his public ministry after he was baptized in the Jordan River by John, he went to the synagogue where he had grown up. It's recorded for us in Luke chapter 4. And when he Stood up to read. you remember where he read from? He read from the book of Isaiah chapter 61. And this is what he read. He said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That was the, 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 the highlighted description of Jesus Christ's ministry. Did you take note of I'm proclaiming liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound? You understand, the ministry that Jesus began is the ministry that we continue. We're just continuing to do what Jesus began to do. And every one of us are to be involved in the ministry of recovery. There's three statements I give you to begin with. Number one is every Christian should be in the ministry of recovery. Every one of us is in the ministry of recovering captives from the snare of Satan. That's, that's our job. That's, that's our, uh, he's given us that ministry of reconciliation. Be reconciled to God. And so every one of us, that's our responsibility and that's our job to do. And every Christian should be involved in the ministry of reconciliation or recovery. That's not, it's not just for the pastor. It's not just for the missionary. It's not just for the uh, deacon or the Sunday school teacher or the evangelist. It's for every single believer. All right, number two, no one recovers without God. No one recovers without God. We don't just simply decide to do the right thing. We only do that in response to what God is doing inside of us. In other words, God does the work of repentance. Remember, we talked last week about repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And so we repent, we have a change of heart, a change of mind about it, and that came about because of our acknowledging of the truth of God. We 
decide the right thing because of what God has done inside of each of us. So we can't even take credit for that. I, I don't like it in our recovery group when people say, well, I'm just proud of how far I've come. I cringe when I hear that. First of all, you should you got to be careful about the use of that word proud and pride. You know, it's never one time used in a good light in the entire Bible. Not one time. Jesus, God didn't look down from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm proud. No, the Bible says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. What did he say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Pleased. You know, it's a great thing, mom and dad, if you would tell your children not that you're proud of them but that you're pleased with them. Many, many children feel like they never can please their parents. Nothing they do is ever good enough. Well, it's because parents never tell them they're pleased. They always talk about how they're proud they are. And uh, you don't want pride in your life. Okay? Is this on? You don't want pride in your life. Okay? You don't want that. And so, don't, don't take the credit yourself. All the credit goes to God. Without Him, we can do nothing. Okay? Number three. Third statement, everyone who is in the snare of the devil has been taken captive by him and has been taken captive by him has a personal responsibility for their freedom. In other words, when you're captive in the snare of Satan, you have nobody to blame but yourself. It is the will of God that we be free from any of Satan's strongholds in our life. That we live a life that's victorious in Jesus Christ. That's His plan. But we'll never get to that victorious life if we don't cooperate with God. God has given us a free will. And man can resist the Holy Spirit. Man can resist what God wants to do in each one of our lives. And not only can the unsaved resist the Spirit of God as he's dealing with them about salvation, but the saved can resist the Holy Spirit of God when it comes to what God wants to do in their life for sanctification and for service for Him. And so if we've been ensnared, God says, we talked last week about how you have to acknowledge the truth, and, and that comes, remember we talked about, that comes from the Word of God, it comes from the, the servants of God, the authorities that God puts in your life whether it be parents or pastors or teachers. And so you have to come to the agreement there that I'm going to cooperate with the Word of God and with the servants of God that can help me recover myself out of the snare of Satan. Now what does it mean to recover? When we say they can recover themselves, the best way to define a Bible term is to look and see how it's used in the Bible. And I want to look at some scriptures tonight that talk about recovery in order to get God's perspective on what recovery really is. In fact, uh, let me, uh, let's go to the first one. It's in, it's in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel 30, I think this will give us an overall definition here of what recovery is. 1 Samuel 30. Notice with me verse 1. <clears throat> it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. And David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest and to Ahimelech's son, 
To him, like son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, what's the last two words? Recover all. There's the word recover. Recovery. So what does it mean to have recovery? It means you get back that which was taken by the enemy. David, pursue, for you'll get back what was taken by the enemy. They've been out fighting a battle. They return back to their hometown, and it's not there. <laughs> it's been burned to the ground, and all their wives and children are gone. Now, at this point, they don't know if they killed them and took them or took them captive. I imagine they probably figured they were kidnapped since there were no bodies. And so they decided, uh, what are we going to do? But they were so grieved and so emotional, what did they want to do? Kill David. We're going to stone you. Well, he's a little bit distressed over that, you can understand. And uh, he, he didn't complain. He didn't got, try to defend himself. He went to the Lord and encouraged himself from the Lord. In fact, David did what we should always do when we're under attack. Seek counsel from the Lord. When you're under attack and you know that the, the, the things have turned on you or people have turned on you, listen, the place to go isn't social media. The place to go isn't Facebook or Instagram or any other place or, or the telephone. The place to go is God. Go seek counsel of the Lord. He inquired at the Lord, Shall I pursue after this troop? And God answered him. God will answer you. Don't, don't one of the things that we, we realize that when you're, when you're in the snare of Satan, you're, you're in a spiritual warfare. All right? Understand that. You, you can't fight a spiritual battle with fleshly weapons. So what weapon do you use? You use the weapon of prayer. And you go to God. And you seek counsel from Him. And that's why you can seek the Lord. And, and it's not wrong to go to someone uh, who, uh, a, a pastor, a teacher, a Christian you admire, look up to, who knows the Word of God. But don't get, go to get their counsel. Go to have them point you to what God says. Okay, have him, have him tell me in the Bible, what does God say about this problem? Or what does God say about that problem? And let's get the answer from God and what God has to say about it. And so recover means you get back that which was taken by the enemy. That's recovery. Okay, that's how the Bible uses that word. Now, then you ask yourself this question. What has been taken by the enemy? Well, what happens, what, what gets taken by the enemy when you're ensnared by Satan? The first thing is relationships. Relationships. When we sin against God, and we sin against others, or we sin against our own souls, it always affects our relationships. Part of the recovery process pro process is God will restore relationships. David and his men, when they pursued, if you read the rest of that chapter, you find out they pursued, they overtook them, they, they defeated the Amalekites, and they recovered all, just like God said they would. What's it mean? They got their wives and their sons and their daughters back, and their relationships were restored, like they were before. Now, you understand something, and that that doesn't always happen overnight. And it doesn't happen usually as fast as the one who's been ensnared by Satan wants it to. We deal with it on Friday nights. We deal with it in the prisons. You know, people who've been, been very hurt. I, I told you we used to have the men fill out on the back of the slips they have. We used to have them fill out any loved ones or family members that we could contact to see if maybe we'd get them involved with Are You Here? Or we could try to minister to them. And uh, we, had to, we stopped doing it. So why'd you stop doing it? They didn't want anything to do with us. <laughs> yeah, more often than not, you got, you got response like this. Well, listen, I'm glad Joe's doing that, but you know that's fine for him. I hope it's from the best, but we don't want anything to do with him anymore, and don't call us anymore. Hang up. And that happened over and over again. What happened? People are hurt. People have been, 
uh, you know, they've been lied to and they've been cheated and they've been stolen from and all kinds of things. And they just say, hey, I hope that he gets his life straightened out, but we're done. Okay? Now, does God, is God ever able to restore those relationships? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. But it definitely, listen, it will be in his time, not your time. Let me give you an example. I was reading uh, about this, and um, there was a church in Buffalo, New York, and they had uh, started a Reformers Unanimous and RU program in their church, and um, they launched their program, and they had a catered dinner for people in their community who were involved in law enforcement and some judges in the area and uh, people who, who deal with addicted people. And uh, they invited Pastor Kingsbury to come speak for them, and he related this story. He said before he got up to speak, he said a man gave his testimony. His addiction had broken all of his relationships. His parents had cut their ties with him. His wife had left him and taken the children. He just made a complete mess out of his life. They even had the detective who arrested him at the dinner. But guess what? That night, as he listened to this man, he said, the detective who arrested him was there. His parents were at the dinner. His wife was at the dinner. God had wonderfully restored those relationships. He gave his testimony. He thanked God for his recovery. He even thanked God for the detective being a servant of God. He said, Pastor Kingsbury related the story. He said, I saw a woman who was warden over a large prison in New York sitting there with her mouth open in disbelief, marveling at the testimony. Recovery, listen, recovery is more than just stopping harmful behavior or destructive and sinful habits. It includes a restoration of relationships that have been destroyed. Now that restoration is it going to happen by accident? Okay? Not long ago, somebody came to me and wanted some help. Just not a stranger to me. Somebody who I've tried to help before, often. But because of their disobedience, they were just still in a bad place. And when he asked for help, I said, I, I, I'd like to help you, but you won't let me be your pastor. You don't come to church. When I give you advice, you don't follow it. In fact, you do the opposite. You can't go to your family because you burnt those bridges because you continue to deliberately and habitually sin. If I help you this time, what is going to change? And he just looked at me. And he got up and walked out of my office. You know why? Because nothing was going to change. Nothing was going to change. You see, no matter how much you say you want to be released from the snare of the devil, if you are not willing to do anything different, it's not going to happen. No matter how much someone else wants you free, they can't free you. We talked last night about how you have to have that key, that key that acknowledges the truth. And no one else can turn that key for you. You have to do that. But Currington makes the comment after a New Year's Eve get-together where he went to the church with the all-19 activity. Some of you in RU are familiar with that story. And he didn't want to go there. Here he was, and he was just, just, just getting back into church. He still had long hair. He said he still reeked of cigarettes. But that youth pastor was kind enough to say, why don't you help us with crowd control tonight? He said, I didn't want to be there. My friend Colleen down the road was having a party, and that's where I wanted to go. But he said it would be the first sober New Year's Eve that he would have in 10 years. And he stayed there and spent the night, and he's driving home the next morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, and he said, and coming down the street at this large intersection, he saw three of his friends who had been at that girl's house. And he looked at their eyes. He knew they'd been up all night ingesting drugs. And he said, right then, he said, something, something flipped inside of me, a switch flipped inside of me. And I said, I'm never going to live that way again. See, nobody could flip that switch for him. 
That's got to that's got to come from you responding to God, and something that's that that switch flipping and saying that's it. I'm never doing that anymore. I'm done. And he was, went home and slept, and he and he never went back. The devil will do. Listen, you have to you have to repent and change before you'll ever recover. If you don't change your thinking and you don't decide to go a different direction, then nothing's going to change. The devil will do everything he can to keep you from restoring and rebuilding your relationships. Because what the devil likes to do is he likes to isolate people. And if he can destroy your relationship with your pastor, with your parents, with your church, with your members of your family, you know what he's done? He's got you right where he wants you. You're by yourself. And you get to thinking, nobody understands me. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody gets it. I'm the only one. And that's just where the devil wants you to be. You're right in his snare. David didn't just recover his family, but there's something else. Remember what the Lord said? You will surely recover all. So, he not only recovered relationships, the second thing that we see he recovered was his finances. He recovered all. When you see the biblical principles of finances has taught through the Scriptures, you will benefit from following them. Okay? You take the work ethic of the Bible as it's presented, and it will be helpful to you. It does work. It will work. There's more than 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that deal with the matter of finances. God's not promising you a mansion and a yacht and a boat and a big fancy car or anything like that. But you know what He does? He promises to bless those who are diligent in handling the finances that He entrusts to us. He'll bless you for that. And some of you experience that blessing. But you know what I've noticed? I noticed nobody ever became a millionaire by making license plates in prison. Nobody ever became a millionaire by being a drug addict. You, you, it's a, uh, the always, always looking for an a, a extra five, an extra ten, an extra fifteen. You got a little like bar me? Hey, I'm a little hard. I need this. For, I need twenty dollars for this. I need, always wanting to get some money. Because they don't have anything. They're broke. Or they steal. They shoplift. They do whatever they can to try to get some money. When you're, ensnared your economic growth and your economic stability is taken out of your control. The devil has come to kill, steal, and destroy. You know the cost of sin is enormous. The average cost of incarceration of an individual in a prison in the state of Ohio is right around $30,000 a year. Did you know we have just a little over 52,000 in prison in Ohio? Multiplied by $30,000 a year. I haven't multiplied that out, but that's a lot of money. Sin costs us. Costs us. The prisons right now in Ohio, according to the statistics I looked up, at are 132% capacity. That's why, that's why they're considering legislation, even nationally, about letting these drug dealers and these uh, non-threatening people loose. They're going to put them out of prison because there's not room to get all the ones who've done violent crimes. But what is that going to do to the opioid crisis? You just turn these guys back loose on the street, that's all they know. I'll tell you what you do. You <laughs> I, can, I can take you around about six, seven guys or so that we've seen come through the RU program that are out now serving God, working jobs, 
living for the Lord. Never ever going back to that place again. Why? Because they've had a heart change. See? They are not in the snare anymore. They're not in the snare of Satan. And, and that's the furthest thing that will ever happen to them. Satan is a thief and a robber. And he'll rob you of your finances. That's why we don't make any apologies when uh, the RU curriculum here on Friday nights that we have for the community, uh, people buy the curriculum. $12 for this book or $15 for that book. You say, why do you, man, that's money. You know what, that's nothing compared to what they used to pay to get a hit. What they paid to take care of their addiction. And if you can pay that kind of money to, to get high, you can pay that kind of money to recover yourself out of the snare of Satan and put some effort into it. So you find out when you recover from those snares and you begin to work and you begin to be faithful, you begin to be stable, and you begin to, to, to live each day as under the Lord, you find out that, that all of a sudden you have more money than what you ever had when you were in his snare. You had more money you ever had when you, were, when you were dealing with the thief and the robber. You find out that you serve a God who can open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. That there's not room enough to receive it. And so they get your finances back. But that's not all. The third thing that I think you can recover when the Lord gives you recovery is health. Look at 2 Kings chapter 1. You know, you can get your health back. 2 Kings chapter 1. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for Ahaziah when he fell through a... Am I in the right place? I'm in the second Kings, but I'm in chapter 1, but I'm not seeing that. Where am I missing it? Yeah, I'm there. Oh, okay, there he is. All right, somehow Ahaziah disappeared from me for a minute there. All right, Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab, and Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. Now, what did he do? He sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and saying to them, is it not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And of course, it, it happened just the way he said it would happen. And he died. Listen, Ahab was one of the most wicked kings. Ahaziah is Ahab's son. Okay? And so, Ahaziah, when he wants to know if he's going to get well, he goes back to the, the Baal, uh, the Beelzebub, the, the god of the, it's actually the fly god of Egypt, to find out his pro prognosis. It's unbelievable. God hears it and sends Elijah, Elijah, his prophet, to go and intercept the messengers and tell them that absolutely you're not going to get better, you're going to die. Now, this isn't, this isn't rocket science at all, but when you and I disobey God, there are going to be consequences. When a person recovers and stops behaviors that have been damaging their health, it doesn't mean all the consequences of that are going to be over. They're still going to have to deal with those consequences. You know, it's healthy to live for God. It's a healthy life to live as God says you ought to live. And you'll be better off, not only are you better off spiritually, but you're better off physically. I remember when I was in Bible college, there was a man on staff at the church we were in, and he ran the rescue mission. And uh, uh, they called him Brother Sully. And he only had uh, half of his arm. He just he had always had the suit coat, but there was nothing sticking out the bottom of it. 
You know what happened to him? Before he got saved, he was in the syndicate, so to speak, and somebody had it out for him, and he went to open his car door one night, and it was rigged. And it blew half his arm off. Now, Sully got saved, but his arm didn't grow back. He still had consequences to pay for his sin. And there's, uh, you, you, can't, you can't think God's going to wipe all those away. There are, there are consequences to disobeying God. And you better know it. And be, God, God certainly can be gracious. But you remember that there are consequences. David knew what it was like to suffer physical consequences for his sin. In Psalm 39, he said this, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. O spare me, that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. David said, God, I want to recover my strength again. He was, he was so uh, zapped of his strength and had no energy and no, no, no ability to get up and go. No ability to go out and fight. And he needed to recover. And when he recovered, his relationship with the Lord would be reinstated and he would regain his strength and his physical vitality. Sometimes there's a there's always a correlation. You have to understand, there, there's always a correlation between your spiritual and your physical. And you can sometimes, when we're suffering spiritually, it can be a physical issue. And it needs to be cared for physically and you can get things back right spiritually. Do you understand? When, when Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal and he ran ahead, and remember, he, he got discouraged and he sat under the, 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 the juniper tree, so to speak. You remember that? And he said, Lord, just take my life. Well, the first thing God did was he sent an angel, and you know what the angel did? He fed him. Then what did he have him do? He let him sleep. When he came back, he fed him again and let him sleep again before he ever started talking to him. What? He needed some physical nourishment. He needed some physical things going on before he could deal with them on a spiritual level. But I think the opposite can be true as well. When you're not right spiritually, you can suffer physically for it. It affects your physical health. Those who are ensnared by drugs and alcohol know that well. They can zap you of your physical strength and your physical vitality. And certainly, when, when you, you, see, uh, you see these pictures often in, in, in Rockford, and, uh, you know, the before and the after. And how different they look from when they come in, from when they come out. It was, uh, I think Terry Lynn was saying something the other day. She was down in an area uh, taking somebody home from church. And it was an old area where she used to get drugs. And she had people with her. She wasn't by herself. But, you know, they, there were a couple people there who came up and, she recognized them, but you know what? They didn't recognize her. Didn't know who she was. The change that has taken place. That's what God does. He restores your health. Okay? And He can do that. So, we recover the um, relationships. We recover the finances. We recover the health. And then D, we recover a vision. Our vision. In Luke 4, again, where we talked about Jesus coming to give his first sermon at his beginning of his ministry, Luke 4. Again, verse 18, the verse we quoted earlier. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now, did Jesus mean that literally? Did He heal blind people when He was here? Sure He did. And that, that's part of it. He would obviously heal folks that were physically blind, but I think this is also a spiritual application. When you're ensnared by Satan, your vision gets clouded. 
you don't see clearly what's really going on. Sometimes when people are recovered and, and they get on the other side, you know what they say? How could I have been so blind? How could I not see what was, what was going on? Or I should have saw that coming. I should have saw what was happening. But they didn't. And a lot of times, when other people try to see it for them, they don't want to hear it. Their vision is clouded. When you're tangled in the snare of Satan, you don't realize your loss of clarity and your loss of vision. It's only later when you look back, you realize that you don't see all the things that are going on. I, I thought, when I was going over this, I thought right away of the prodigal son. You know, hey, give me my inheritance. I'm ready to take it. I can, I can. Gave him his money. He took off, ready to live it up. Didn't last too long, did it? Pretty soon he spent it all. And then the famine came. The economy turned. And man, there was no, 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 no food, no job. And by the way, no man gave to him. All of a sudden, all his friends he had that he was partying up with, they're all gone. Why? His money's gone. That's why. Finally, he works, get a job working at a pig farm. You understand, for a Jewish boy, that's hitting bottom. <laughs> he's slopping the pigs and he starts looking and the, the, the stuff he's feeding the pigs looks good to him. You've got to be pretty hungry when that happens. But the Bible says, remember, it says there in Luke 15, He came to Himself. And He said, you know what? My Father's hired servants have it better than I do. All of a sudden, he began to see things. His vision is coming back to him. And he has a change. He can see things that he never saw before. And now when he comes back to his father, he says, Father, make me as one of your hired servants. Oh, he left saying, give me, give me, give me. I know what I'm doing. Now he comes back just saying, make me one of your hired servants. Now the father would have nothing of it. See, recovery means he puts a robe on him and shoes on his feet and a ring on his finger. Hmm? He's going to recover all that he lost. That's recovery. It's another great example of it. God's recovery is always a full-scale recovery. It involves your, your relationships. It involves your health. It involves your finances. It involves your vision, your ability to see things. All those things that are lost or hampered when you're in captivity. When you're in the snare of Satan. Things change. You've got to get to the point where you say, okay, I'm going back to church. I'm going back to my Bible. I'm going to go back to the people of God. I'm going to hang around people who love the Lord. And I'm not going to hang around those who don't love the Lord. I'm going to get the right people in my life and the wrong people are out of my life. And I'm going to acknowledge the truth and God will grant me repentance so I can recover myself out of the snare of the devil. I've seen it. You've seen it. We see it. All you have to do is turn on the news. You see people who act like that maniac in Mark 5. You see them act that way now. Now they're called rock and roll or hip hop and they make millions of dollars a year. Thank you guys. Got two with me. There's no greater joy than watching transformation take place. That's a tremendous thing. You don't, we don't know. Bobby has seen the transformation in Danny Wright. We, we see a little bit of it from when he first came nine, nine years ago, I think now. 2019 will be 10 years. Remember, I've told you the story about uh, when we were, he come and go out visiting with me and I'd take him out soul winning and we were sitting out right where I parked during the week, right out there in the, and the, beside the fellowship hall, and we were talking about the visits, and I said, Danny, you're doing great, and he had on a suit coat, and he had on a tie. 
And I said, Danny, everything about you reminds me of the, the new man you are in Christ. Except one thing. He said, what's that? He still had a diamond earring sitting in that ear right there. I said, that earring in your ear. I said, that doesn't identify you with uh, who you are now. It identifies you who you were then. I'll never forget. He reached right up and ripped that thing out. Man, I thought, that had to hurt. He just went, Psh. He said, you'll never see that again. Well, it's been nine years. I've never seen it again. See? That's, that's the spirit you have. That's the attitude. That's the transformation. I wish you could see when he goes into the prison and talks to those men. It's like, it's like he knows, and by the way, he sat where they sat. And, and when, he, when he talks to them and says, it's almost like he's reading their mind because he knows what they're thinking because that's what he thought when he sat there. And there's an there's immediate connection there that he has. But what hope those guys have looking at him saying, hey, if God will do that for him, God will transform me. Maybe in, maybe in 10 years or 15 years, that'll be me. And, and I'll get to come in here and preach to these men. Nothing greater than transformation. First you see him untamable and uncontrollable, cutting themselves, not dressed very well, screaming, cursing. And then you see him clothed. And you see him sitting at the feet of Jesus in their right mind. There's nothing better than that. Nothing better than that in all the world recover themselves. We're going to talk next week about, well, I won't talk next week. We'll talk in a few weeks about the snare of the devil. Just what is that? And how can we recover ourselves out of that snare? What are the snares that Satan uses to take us captive? Next Wednesday night, uh, right, that's Wednesday right after Christmas, Brother Yoder is going to share with us from Uganda and the pictures and uh, what happened there, the just literally hundreds of people that were saved. Uh, folks baptized, preachers that were encouraged and helped, and, and things are still happening now. They're just amazing. Uh, things in schools and such. And uh, don't miss that. You, you, you don't want to miss that Wednesday night. So make a point to be here <coughs> Wednesday night after Christmas. All right? Let's stand together, and uh, we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you now for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the instruction here again that was given to Timothy that's helped us this evening, for we're all in the ministry of recovery. And Lord, I pray that if some are here tonight, and maybe they're the ones, as you, they, they listen this evening, they say, you know, I, I'm in the snare. I pray, Lord, that You would help them to acknowledge the truth and grant them repentance. And may they cooperate with what You're telling, what You're doing in their heart and in their life. And I pray they'd recover themselves out of the snare and you'd restore all that the devil has taken. Restore those relationships. Restore the finances. Restore the health. Restore the vision for them to see things the way you see things and view things the way you view things. And Lord, help us to be faithful to this ministry of recovery in our lives. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Make us mindful that you go with us from this place. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.